Melting polar ice caps, rising ocean waters, and extreme wildfires are all symptoms of climate change in different parts of the world, but not so much here in the Midlands. It is easy to assume that climate change is their problem and not ours, so why should we care? We'll explain the various ways that rising temperatures are impacting our environment right here in the Midlands and what's being done to mitigate the threats. So join us for our Watch Fox special, South Carolina Mercury Rising. The Midlands is frequently the hottest part of South Carolina. Aided by the warming downslope winds off the mountains and too far away from the ocean to be cooled by the sea breeze. According to Climate Central, over the past 50 years in Columbia, the average annual number of days with highs of at least 95 degrees has increased by 16 days. Extreme heat is the number one weather hazard in the United States. It's becoming more frequent and intense thanks to our warming planets and growing urban infrastructure. In places like right here in downtown Columbia, structures such as buildings and roads absorb and re-emit heat more than natural landscapes. These result in urban islands of hotter temperatures compared to surrounding rural areas. The city of Columbia is actively exploring ways to reduce the impacts of intense urban heating for those most vulnerable. From the famously hot city to the new southern hotspot, Columbia's identity has always centered around the heat. It's just hot. It's just hot. It's just hot. As the years go by, that famous heat is only getting worse. Two summers ago, USC right. geography professor yeah. Kirsten Dow and several other community members came together to conduct a study to find out which parts of our hot city are in fact the hottest. And over here on the sidewalk, it's 112 degrees. The results show the difference in temperature between a thick tree canopy and Columbia's heat islands is about 10 degrees. Now the city has a map of where the priority areas are, where it's extra hot. The city is exploring two ways to reduce the urban heat island effect, smart surfaces and trees. Smart surfaces cover everything from light colored pavement and roofs to green spaces and trees that reflect rather than absorb the heat. A mix of these surfaces can reduce the temperature by five degrees in the peak summertime. If you could cut something back five degrees, I think we'd all be happy. According to a USC study, Columbia's tree canopy shrank by almost 25% between 2005 and 2019, due largely to urban development. The city is trying to curb this trend by planting more trees than it takes down, as well as getting the community involved. Through the Beat the Heat, Plant a Tree campaign launched in July, the city hopes to give away 1,750 trees over the next five years. Superintendent of Forestry and Beautification, Brian Niger, hopes families can make a connection while creating more shade. You never hear about the tree that you have in your backyard that when you bought in, but you always hear about that tree that grandpa planted many years ago. Tree shade can reduce annual AC costs by 10 to 50 percent, but the benefits go well beyond the bank account. I am fortunate enough to live in a, in a uh, neighborhood that has a lot of tree coverage and a lot of sidewalks. And the neighborhood I live in, everybody's out and about, the f kids are playing on the street, families are walking up and down the street. We've got actually a really serious health issue here. Um, that we sometimes just call comfort in the South, right? And it's not, it's a serious, um, it's a serious stressor on people who are already ill. And it, you know, it's climate change, it's gonna get, there's gonna be more. The power of trees go way beyond the ability to cool us off. Trees like these help remove carbon dioxide and pollutants from the air, which then offset greenhouse gases and improve air quality. They also soak up storm water and reduce the threat of floods, which the Midlands is far too familiar with. The historic and deadly flood of 2015 is remembered by many across the Midlands. People like Jim Reed saw nearly 20 inches of rain. I got up, I looked in my backyard, there was no standing water. 30 minutes later, I look out and my backyard's flooded and the water, you could almost literally see it rising. Next thing I know, there was a fireman banging on my front door who said, grab what you can and get out. The storm led to devastating flooding, washing out roads, dams, homes, and local businesses. Anything I could, I put it, chairs on tables, on top of beds, I did anything I could to try to salvage anything. It, it, it was a, a big undertaking. The Earth's atmosphere is getting warmer. Warmer air can hold more water vapor, leading to more rain and heavy downpour. 
So much rain that the city of Columbia's infrastructure sometimes can't keep up. Definitely revealed a number of potential opportunities to improve things in, in the city of Columbia with, re with respect to stormwater. Frances Bryan is an engineer with the city of Columbia. She says the city has invested $93 million in stormwater repairs. Since 2015, the city has started several programs to ensure it won't happen again. What we do is we conduct a watershed-wide study, and so that looks at the entire watershed that feeds into a stream or a river and identifies the critical points that could benefit from upgrades. As weather patterns change, the city's plans change as well. The city is sort of set up uh, in, in an ideal way to accommodate changes in our weather patterns. And that's because all of our design standards and our design requirements are tied to standardized weather measurements. According to Climate Central, flooding costs South Carolina nearly $500 million every year. That number is expected to go up 58% by 2050. Columbia is trying to be a step ahead before the next disaster strikes. So as our climate changes in the future, those standards will be updated by a national agency and we'll have a specific uh, set of values that's used for our specific community and those new developments will naturally be required to meet that because that's already in our design requirement. Jim Reese says that since 2015, and people in his neighborhood have taken steps to get ahead. What we've done in, in this neighborhood is to be proactive, clean out stormwater drains because so many of them are clogged with pine straw, leaves and such. Clean out drains near your house. Coming up next, Gators at Risk, a look at how research conducted right here in the Midlands exposes a dire outlook for the future of the American alligator. And later, a closer look at how one plant is thriving in a warmer world and why that's bad news for us. Alligators were first spotted here at Columbia Canal and Riverfront Park back in 2007 and have been regular visitors over the past several years. As temperatures continue to climb, gators are more likely to call South Carolina home for longer periods of time. However, it's those same warming temperatures that could ultimately put the entire species at risk. Here at the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory in Aiken County, University of Georgia Associate Professor Dr. Ben Parrott is on a mission to figure out if reptiles like the American alligator have a future in a world of warmer temperatures. It's a beautiful animal. The work began in 2012 when researchers began collecting data from 86 alligator nests at John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida and here at the Tom Yaki Wildlife Center near Georgetown, South Carolina. Staff and students like Samantha Bach wanted to find out how much the surrounding air temperature affected alligator nest temperatures. As it turns out, it has a big impact. Across years, the best predictor of mean nest temperatures or average nest temperatures are maximum daily air temperatures. In other words, the hotter it gets outside, the hotter it gets inside the nest. That's crucially important because uh, the temperature in the nest determines whether they will develop as either a male or a female. Females form when nest temperatures are below 88.7 degrees Fahrenheit or above 94.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Nest temperatures from 90.5 to 92.3 degrees Fahrenheit produce males. Climate models project nest temperatures will increase 2.9 to 6.7 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. The result could be an imbalance of alligator genders. As maximum air temperatures increase with climate change, we might expect to see increasing proportions of male hatchlings. Adult female alligators could adapt to these warmer temperatures to some extent by adjusting nest locations and seeking out locations with more shade. But evidence suggests they're more concerned about predators. Based all on the evidence we have, there does not appear to be any sort of behavioral way that she can, uh, it's not like she's really paying attention to the weather and saying, it's a really hot year, I'm gonna lay a cooler nest 
or it's a really cool year, I'm going to lay it out in the sun this year. So does this gender imbalance mean the American alligator is doomed for extinction? Probably not. But it is reasonable to anticipate a shift in their location as they adapt to warmer temperatures. The question is, is what's our tolerance? So if, if their range moves from the, the southeastern U.S. where it is now, will we tolerate it moving up into Maryland or Virginia, uh, for example? Um, and, and, and so I'm not sure about that. While fewer alligators may sound like a good thing to some, Reducing alligator populations can have cascading impacts. They're really key components of healthy ecosystems that we care about. These wetlands and marshes that are habitats for waterfowl and good fishing um, and recreation um, habitats. And alligators are a key component of keeping those ecosystems functioning and healthy. With every step you take in the woods, there may be poison ivy nearby. It is a part of our natural habitat in South Carolina, and experts say it's becoming more and more visible as greenhouse gases continue to rise. Poison ivy is a vining plant. It's native to this area. Herrick Brown is a curator at the uh, University this, this of South Carolina. He has studied plants like poison ivy for decades. There are um, a variety of different subspecies that occur across the United States. You might see it sometimes in uh, places like Congaree National Park. Um, it grows just about in any kind of habitat, but in certain situations it can get quite large. And for these plants, their environmental conditions mean a lot. Depending on the, the habitat, the uh, amount of water that's available to the plant, whether it's growing in a high dry sand hill or in a floodplain forest, you might see some drastically different sizes to the leaf shape. John Cuffert is a geography professor at the University of South Carolina and says our changing climate is helping poison ivy thrive. That when we say climate change, there are really a number of different elements that that can relate to which are going to affect plants differently. That might be carbon dioxide increases that we've seen over the last two centuries. It could be changes in temperature. But Thanks to the rising carbon dioxide levels, poison ivy is growing faster and bigger than ever before. Imagine um, photosynthesis, which is the way in which plants are going to be producing sugars that they need. There are three key elements to that. Sunlight, it's carbon dioxide, and it's water. And by changing the amount of carbon dioxide that's present in the atmosphere, that can change the rate at which organisms are going to photosynthesize. With carbon dioxide levels rising around the world and rainfall increasing in South Carolina, experts believe poison ivy will become more and more common in the palmetto state. Poison ivy might be one of the most responsive plants because it's as a vine, unlike a tree or a shrub, can dedicate more of the sugars that it produces to growing faster and growing bigger. Rise in urban developments has impacted poison ivy as well. Whereas humans develop areas, we're creating new habitats for it to move into. Up next, fireflies are one of the staples of summer nights in the Midlands. What scientists say could put their future at risk. Later, an up-close look at how one South Carolina facility is finding out what it takes for homes and businesses to stand up to nature's worst weather. One of only three species of synchronous fireflies in all of North America is right here in the Midlands. The light show draws thousands of people to the Midlands every year. The question is now, are they safe in a warmer world? Let's take a closer look. Some call them lightning bugs, or fireflies, but most don't know they aren't a bug or a fly. They are beetles. Um, they are carnivores so in the larval stage they eat slugs and snails and worms experts like biology professor sarah lower say fireflies have short lives and they spend most of their lives in the larval state but when they grow up to be adults that's when the light show starts as adults they're looking for mates um, so the flashes that you think about when you think fireflies are how they find each other. For synchronous fireflies here at Congaree National Park, finding each other is like the rhythm of a song. With their beauty and entertainment, 
These fireflies need moisture to live. So fireflies we think of as being really closely linked with moisture. Um, they typically, you can find them in areas that are sort of near streams. Fireflies can be found anywhere in the world except Antarctica. Although the insects are resilient, scientists have one concern. During periods of drought, the firefly populations really go down. There are more than 2,000 species of fireflies, and Laura says 14% of them are becoming endangered in certain regions. Like uh, one summer, it didn't rain for like the whole month of August, and so fireflies were gone. Um, and, and didn't show up again until the following year. Um, we do think that they can, if, if conditions aren't favorable, that they can delay pupation and become an adult later. But she says you can help scientists like her by keeping record of when and where you see the insects light up. Coming up, from hurricanes to tornadoes to wildfires, homes across the country are becoming more at risk to hazardous weather how one South Carolina company is working to secure homes from natural disasters. Despite the growing threat of floods and other natural disasters, South Carolina was the fastest growing state in the country last year with a population increase of nearly 2%. This rise of population in high risk areas has put a strain on the insurance industry. 28 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters occurred in the US last year alone, the most on record. Nationally, the insurance industry paid out $1.11 for every dollar collected, the worst underwriting performance in over a decade. Now homeowners are footing the bill to make up for those losses. The losses that were incurred last year are a primary driver of why we're seeing rising rates in markets across the country this year. According to Bankrate, the average insurance cost for a $300,000 home in South Carolina has risen to nearly $200 a month. One way homeowners can lower their insurance rate? Making their home more disaster resistant. One facility off the road in Chester County is using science and a whole lot of wind power to fortify the country from future natural disasters. The Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety is their name and destroying houses is their game. In the name of science. And because there is no other place like this in the world. So some of the data we collect here is just incredibly unique. The IBHS Research Center is a large scale laboratory helping researchers understand how structures handle nature's worst weather. This is nine of our fans. We have 105 of them in total. They're each about six feet in diameter. And these are what generate the 130 mile an hour winds that we can produce here at IBHS. Along with hurricane force winds, these scientists can simulate wind driven rain, hail, and wildfires in a controlled environment. The results found here are passed on to the insurance industry and lawmakers in the hopes of improving building code requirements across the country. The insurance industry can better understand losses, building code officials can better understand how to improve building codes, homeowners can better understand how to build, what questions to ask of roofers and contractors when they are building homes. So many things have become possible because we can see things happening here at the lab. After years of study, the Institute created the Fortified Standard. Fortified is IBHS's program for stronger building. It's a voluntary beyond code construction and re-roofing standard. This re-roofing standard calls for the use of stronger nails, a sealed roof deck, and better protection along the edges. A roof below this level can lead to cascading effects. So for a damaged, unsealed 2,000 square foot roof, up to nine bathtubs worth of water can enter your attic for every one inch of rain that falls. Engineers here have also found having a wind rated garage door is crucial to the structural integrity of houses. When your garage door is damaged, you're more likely to have structural damage to the roof and walls surrounding it. Once a home has been built or retrofitted to this standard, a certificate is issued that can be passed on to their insurer. 17 insurers in South Carolina provide discounts to homes with this standard. 
The state also offers tax credits for purchases applied toward improving the durability of homes. During Hurricane Sally, we had about 17,000 fortified homes in Alabama exposed to the storm and less than 100 of them had any kind of claim. With the peak of hurricane season around the corner, the Institute recommends homeowners take action now to protect their property. We have the science and understanding to reduce the impact of these events. We just need to apply it. Back here in the Skywatch Weather Center, Clara and I have been busy tracking what has already been a very active hurricane season. Back in July, Hurricane Barrel rapidly intensified from a tropical depression to a major hurricane in just 48 hours. Soon after, it became the earliest Category 5 hurricane on record in the Atlantic. Then in early August, Tropical Storm Debbie covered the southeast U.S. with excessive rainfall and flooding. As much as 22 inches of rain fell in South Carolina, the second highest total caused by a tropical system on record. Research shows tropical systems around the world, just like Debbie, have slowed down at 10 percent and even more over land over the past 75 years thanks to climate change. Scientists also know that 90% of the Earth's excess heat is being absorbed by the ocean, leading to record-breaking sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic this year. Warm ocean water is essentially fuel for these storms to rapidly intensify and is one of the main reasons forecasters project this hurricane season to be so active. Now, through a tool called the Climate Shift Index, scientists can determine how much more or less likely ocean temperatures are in our current climate compared to a world without carbon pollution. According to this model, current ocean temperatures across the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea are 50 to 100 times more likely thanks to climate change. While confidence is low on how much climate change will affect the number of tropical systems in the future, we do know the storms that do form are more likely to be more intense. And for every storm that threatens the Midlands, the Skywatch weather team will be here to keep you safe and informed. We thank you for tuning in to our Watch Fox special, South Carolina Mercury Rising. If you want to watch these stories again, head to our website, WACH.com. Click on the Weather tab to find our South Carolina Mercury Rising section. In there, you'll find web exclusives, including extended interviews and behind-the-scenes looks at the ways climate change is impacting us here in the Midlands.